Hello, welcome to AT&T Threat Track for January 20th, 2014. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. We're joined today by John Hogboom. Welcome, John. I'm here again. <laughs> here again. And Matt Kaiser. That's welcome, Matt. Good. Uh, I'm Brian Rexrode, and uh, let's get right into it. And of course, you know, one of the things we're always struggling with are passwords. And uh, there's nothing worse than struggling with passwords that just aren't good enough. So <laughs> this story is not a surprise to me. Yeah. There's a company or a group called Splash Data, and what they do is they do a, a yearly review of the most popular passwords for each year. Um, this year they're basing it on breach data, uh, mm -hmm. exposed passwords from that, which is a pretty good sampling, probably about as good as you're going to get without actually having your own database of user passwords, which you, know, you shouldn't be keeping clear text passwords around, but in case someone does breach them, you can take a look at them and decide uh, which one's the most popular right. and you know before you get too far i want to make sure that we make the distinction here now jim clausing he, he just ha doesn't happen to be here today but he's often done a report on passwords that we see guessed against systems mm -hmm. and this is very distinct these are passwords that people have actually you know they've Used. got in the system they're using yep. and just happen to be uh encountered one way or another and statistically assembled together. So now, do we know uh, if it's from data breaches mostly? Their from my understanding is they, they take a look at the lists of the breaches and oh, okay. passwords from those and, and use this to, to build out their list. Okay. Now, the, they've been doing this for several years and mm -hmm. they've released the 2014 list and there aren't too many surprises on this list in my opinion. The ones that are, you, you would probably guess them first, password is still on the list. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You know, all those clever variations on the same theme are still on the list. And most of these lists would be in, you know, a regular dictionary attack. Mm -hmm. um, they're very common. And I, when you were saying a, f a second ago that, you know, these are the, the passwords we see most commonly guessed, I will bet you money that this list, now that this has been released for this year, people who are doing password uh, guessing attacks are going to be modifying their lists and prioritizing these over other ones because it makes More than sense. More likely the case, yeah. Yep. Yeah, to, to the extent that they don't have, I mean, clearly when there are new ones, they're probably going to add those in. Uh, they probably have their passwords that they have at the top of the list that are, you know, statistically have been successful for them. So mm -hmm. most likely are going to stay at the top of the list. But uh, as you point out, it's uh, most likely those are going to get added in. There, there were some, I, I was surprised how much they've changed. And maybe, maybe the, uh, the sampling that Splash Data is able to get is not really a good statistical sampling. Uh, there's a good possibility there's some biases associated with the data that they are able to get hold of. Uh, Most likely, if you, if you take a look at maybe the, the communities that did get breached and their, mm -hmm. their set of interests, for example, we've got Superman, Mustang, mm -hmm. Master, Batman. You know, if I, I'm looking for Superman and Batman, I, I have an idea of the kind of, of community that might have been breached. I don't know exactly which ones they came from. Probably not Sony Pictures. Probably not Sony Pictures. I mean, it, you know, Too maybe soon? it was. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just guessing here. Could be. <laughs> so I, I think the important yeah. thing to know here is that these are the same kinds of passwords that have been used right. over and over and over. Any, mm -hmm. any site worth its salt should be rejecting these as valid passwords. I've even heard of some sites taking these lists and using them as a blacklist and saying, you're on the list. You're not allowed to use the, You are definitely going to get owned. You mm -hmm. cannot use this as a password. I, and I think that's a very good, uh, a good thing to do, to blacklist passwords. Uh, that's probably more valuable than trying to force a certain level of complexity, in my opinion. That is, you know, I, I, having complexity in passwords is good, but there's a, there's a point where the level of complexity that you're requiring is not necessarily all that, I think, additionally productive. But at the, um, my favorite one is let me in. Yeah. We've seen that for like forever. I, I used that 20 years ago <laughs> and uh, have since learned that that's not one that you want to use. It's consistently on the top, on the top 20. So, Looking at the list though, there's um, some that I don't see that I think were for the longest time thought were the, 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 big, the big few. Um, you ever seen Hackers? I think there's a line in the movie where they say the most popular passwords are sex, secret, and God, and I don't see them on the list, so They're somebody learned something. Somebody learned something. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you said you were mentioning password complexity there, and most, actually, almost all of these passwords on this list would not be accepted by most reputable Even the websites. most basic complexity yeah, requirements. Like, right? You know, most of them require at least one uppercase character, some number, um, 
sometimes a special character in there, which, you know, I don't think any of these ones on this list here mm -hmm. had any uppercase characters in them. You know, surprising. We know there's lots of, you know, most real decent websites out there are forcing some kind of, you know, um, extra, you know, complexity mm -hmm. in their passwords. But a lot of these other things, like little embedded devices that we talk about, these Internet of Things, don't really have strong password rules, if any, Mm -hmm. on them whatsoever when you go to put a new password in. So uh, some of that could be uh, why some of these passwords are so often used too. Yeah, I wonder if they normalized it and if they took all the capitalization out or variations to make it um, a little more, just to make the point. That's possible. It's possible. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I'm not seeing it here in the article, but it's a possibility. Okay. Well, always interesting. And uh, perhaps we can uh, get Jim to do a follow-up on what's been uh, coming into the honeypot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do a little comparative analysis there. All right, next item here is, uh, I guess, John, you've taken a look at the uh, some recent Oracle patches. Can you tell yeah, us? Yeah, this is something Jim normally does too, but he's yeah. not here today. <laughs> so um, uh, Oracle, you know, they release their quarterly, they release their patches on a quarterly cycle. Some other mm -hmm. companies do it on a monthly. So when Oracle releases uh, a patch bundle, it typically has a lot of patches in it. And this one mm -hmm. is no exception. We have a chart here that shows the various product suites that they have, and in each of these product suites, there might be several products. You know, mm -hmm. you could have ten products in some of them, especially uh, uh, the Fusion Middleware, which includes like BEA or the WebLogic server, and uh, some of these other uh, types of software are all in there. In any event, this patch comes out today, uh, January twentieth. If you're watching the show. Uh, so you should take a special note that there are a significant number of patches. You want to check to make sure uh, you patch a bunch of these uh, if, you're, if it applies to you. There's total 167 fixes, 93 of which are remotely exploitable over the network without any authentication. So uh, that's kind of important, um, especially for any, you know, there's several in here that are potentially exploitable that have uh, a lot of network footprint. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure which, they didn't get into details because it's a pre-release bulletin, so you know, I don't know if WebLogic is in that category right. or their HTTP server products, but certainly if there is exploitation against that, it's remotely, I don't know that they are yet because they haven't said which ones are and which ones aren't, right. but those ones you'd be, want to be really careful about. Almost every software package they have has some sort of network component that if you expose it to the internet, would be vulnerable, obviously, here. So the, the big ones to point out uh, that have the highest CV, CVSS score of 10, uh, Java is in there, not a big surprise. Um, and they don't, again, we don't have details of exactly what the exploit vector is, mm -hmm. other than it's highly exploitable. And then there's uh, three others that they listed, which I'm kind of curious to see what this is about, because this is the M10.1, M10.4, M104S server products of theirs. If you're familiar with the Sun product line that Oracle acquired, they have the M10 platform, which is a Spark uh, platform. So I'm not sure if it's in their hardware, you know, maybe something that's firmware based versus mm. software, you know, the, the um, Unix operating system that rides on top of that or, or what part of it is actually exploitable here. But um, those would be important ones to take a look at. A lot of people are probably using those platforms for very, especially in business operations, you might have M10s as yeah. part of your environment, so you'd want to take a look at that. And then one other one that they make mention of that's been getting some press here is this uh, Oracle eBusiness Suite dual table vulnerability that was mm. just announced. One of the a researcher kind of discovered this. The basic gist of this is he discovered when doing an audit of a company for a company mm -hmm. uh, that their Oracle server, actually it's the eBusiness suite, which basically runs some Oracle server underneath of it. Uh, they are dual table, and the dual table is kind of, um, it's kind of like a dummy table in Oracle server that is, it's just part of the distribution. It basically had the public uh, role was granted the index privilege on mm. the dual table. So normally you can't write or create new rows in there, but you could create an index on it. Um, and when, if you're able to create a index that um, is a function-based index, which they have some, you can kind of write a little script as part of your index. Mm -hmm. If you could do something that does that, it will actually execute under the privileges of sys, mm -hmm. which is basically root privileges, so to speak, from an, an Oracle perspective. Right. 
uh, on that table and be able to do things in other tables, like add yourself as an administrator to the, the database. So this is kind of a big vulnerability. Um, apparently, when Oracle went back, he reported this to them. They went back and looked at it. They were kind of confused as to why this code was in there and why this vulnerability exists. So there's a little conspiracy theories forming around this. I don't have any input into that is whether this was an intended backdoor, because it mm -hmm. basically gives you some backdoor functionality. If you right. can get onto the Oracle server, if it's exposed in a way that you could get access to it as either a user, um, you know, even basic user level, you'd be able to elevate your privileges really easily on here. Um, so another important one that's patched in this recent patch bundle that came out. Uh, so that's an important one to take a look at um, if, you, uh, if that applies to you. It's definitely an interesting find. An interesting what? Interesting find. Yeah. Do you, do you know if that, it seems like you can specify a function within there and, and it'll execute a system. Does it have, does, does Oracle have something like the XP command shell function that, that you have in, um, on, on Windows and in the, the oh, I can't I think of the name, MS SQL databases, where you can actually execute something? I don't know. That's a good question, because I'm not really familiar with, the, with I haven't used Oracle in probably 10 years, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I've never tried to do that on there. Um, I only used it as, you know, the... As a legitimate usage? Yeah, the <laughs> legitimate usage of, uh, I haven't ever tried to shell out to anything with it, so I'm not quite and sure. And only that capability does exist. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of those. Okay. So obviously, he was able to determine that this is exploitable and that you, you know, could mm -hmm. easily elevate your privileges with a, I'm sure there's some proof of code, like proof of concept code to leverage this to elevate your privileges and get access to the entire database. So that would be of concern, especially if your database is exposed to the internet in any way, mm -hmm. which I would recommend against, you know, have something like a web server, that's what is talking and then have that talk to the database out Absolutely. of band where yeah. you can't talk to it directly. Yeah, no, we don't have it in the report today, but you know, typically around the time we these uh, patch cycles are announced, we tend to see like a resurgence of scanning activity looking for uh, Oracle database access right. interfaces and things. And of course, that scanning activity is going all the time. It's just a matter of we tend to see a surge around the, the, the patch cycle. So, right. so these were just announced, so maybe this. next week we might see more. I don't know. Mm -hmm. We might see more scan an uptick in scanning on various ports and protocols associated with these vulnerabilities. But there's a lot to go look for. Absolutely. Um, this is a yeah. pretty big patch bundle, so it seems that there's pretty uh, large threat surface. I'm not sure exactly what ports. You know, there's going to be a lot of them mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are potentially scannable. Uh, to see if you can find exploitable devices. Okay. Now you mentioned there's a little conspiracy theory about how some of this code got in there. Yeah. That happens, I guess, in games sometimes too, right, Matt? <laughs> uh, how that code got there? <laughs> how that code got there. Well, here's a question of how that code got there. Um, so Trend Micro wrote uh, a nice, interesting blog post, um, apparently at the Hacks in Taiwan conference, known as mm -hmm. HitCon. Someone gave a, gave a presentation about a PlugX campaign. Now, PlugX is a, a fairly common remote access tool or RAT. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, the notable circumstances around it is that players of the popular online games League of Legends and Path of Exile were actually compromised by a legitimate update to the game. Mm. What happened was attackers managed to break into the update servers and repackaged the update so it was the legitimate update file, mm -hmm. plug X, and a cleaner app, which would sort of manage a few things in the file system, clean up when the uh, installation was done. But from what I understand, um, this happened to a number of players of the game, mostly located in Taiwan. Okay. So I know League of Legends is popular here in the US as well. Mm -hmm. US players don't have to worry about it. If you're in Taiwan, the ta Taiwanese version of the game was the one that was modified. So you may want to worry. There's been, um, I think players have been notified and the hosting provider who was compromised, the one that was actually providing update servers, mm -hmm. has also written to say, we, we acknowledge that this actually happened. Interestingly, the MD5 that was published for that update was actually the MD5 of the bundle and not mm -hmm. of the, just of the malicious, you know, of the, of the it was right. a bundle of malicious software and everything, not and oh, not of the original. Including so the version, everything. Exactly, yeah. which yeah. is which is scary because you know, you typically you would publish an MD5 or a hash mm -hmm. to prove it was a legitimate file. But in this case, whoever was part of that process, just hashed the whole thing. Mm -hmm. 
without checking that it was actually the legitimate file. So do you know anything about how this came about? No details have been released yet, okay. at least not that I'm aware of. Sounds like a potential insider, but you know, you never know. Potentially. You know, it's, it's interesting because PlugX used to be pretty much exclusively used by AP, like real APT actors, mm -hmm. state, nation state in that level. It seems like it's, it's being used more for other purposes now, and I, I, right. I, ex, I don't expect that someone with nation and state targets would use to widely spread malware to a bunch of League of Legends players. Right. It seems more opportunistic in this place, and is, there's, there's ways you can use a rat like that to gain valuable mm -hmm. information about players, gain their credentials, maybe there's some right. money to be made by hacking their accounts for the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering like if League of Legends is one of those ones where you can, you have in-game credits and whatever, all that other crud you acquire <laughs> as part of your game it's experience and that you could sell off and whatnot, so we, maybe there might I, be I some of that. I believe there is, but I think even without that, the, the value of a high-level account in these kind of online games by itself is mm -hmm. worth something on eBay or other, you know, mm -hmm. other markets. Interesting. Just you know, stealing the, the experience level of the account or cashing out all of the, the, the digital goods that the character has can be worth something. All right, they need to put like tracking numbers on your sword of whatever <laughs> so that you could see if it was stolen and who ends up with it or something. Mm -hmm. You know, some kind of digital signature on there or something. Low jack for your, <laughs> your, your plus nine sword of right, sliding. Right, right, right. <laughs> it sounds like the right solution. We'll see if it comes. And I think it, it all comes down to how, whether there's a su sufficient enough motivation to really, you know, implement that additional capability. But it uh, certainly would help. Well, I think the last, the, my last point here is that systems that have these sort of update features, there should be, you know, very strong validation mm -hmm. of what files you're actually using. You know, these things should be signed cryptographically. The client should be able to tell whether or not it's a legitimate update. Those sorts of things. It mm -hmm. seems like here. They may have snuck in a little bit early in that validation process yeah. and gotten it past the original, you know, who was reviewing the file. But right. still, right. good practice to make sure you're doing. So let's uh, kind of shift gears a little bit here. I guess one of the, uh, there was another article related to investigating false positives and how expensive that can be. Yep. So tell us a little more, That's Matt. That's true. So Ponemon Institute has put out uh, a little bit of a release talking about the cost of looking into breaches, mm -hmm. and it seems that an inordinate amount of money, $1.3 million per year on average, is being spent investigating just the false positives yeah. from IDSs, firewalls, other systems that are put in place to defend you. Now, that's, there's always a sort of a, a balance to be struck, whether mm -hmm. you want to have a system that over-reports and there are a number of false positives to make sure that you get all the true positives in there, right. or you under-report, you, you, you sort of make your rules a little less stringent mm -hmm. in order to make sure that everything you're looking at is 100% solid gold, but you might miss a few things. Right. And yeah. I, I don't know that I, I feel that time spent looking at false positives is necessarily time wasted, but it's... So yeah, I think, I, I think this is worth 1.3 million? Yeah. <laughs> Big deal. <laughs> you know? <laughs> to me, that's like cost of doing business in terms of you know, security incident. Well, just the, the process of tuning systems, mm -hmm. getting them configured properly, getting it so that you don't have a lot of false positives takes effort in itself. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not as if that comes for free. So mm -hmm. I think that's an important aspect of this. You know, we were talking earlier, I'd heard a statistic some years ago, and it, you know, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure they said 98% of the alarms that the New York City fire department has to respond to are false positives. And, you know, I think that's one where it really kind of, the rubber hits the road, consider the alternative. Right. You know, if, it, if they only responded to 2% of their alarms, thinking that, you know, that might be the 2% that's actually the right, that, that's not the right answer, obviously. Mm -hmm. And to, uh, you know, perhaps try to tune down and, you know, spend a lot of time screening calls or something, you know, wait for the third or fifth call or something, you know, that's probably not the right answer. And, and it's the same kind of thing when you're looking at this kind of activity. That is, the more you can investigate, the better opportunity you have to actually have a good response to the, the ones that, that are really going to matter. So, you know, I think the other way to look at this, to try to maybe look at it in a more positive way, consider those investigations as a practice activity. Mm -hmm. That is, if you're really running a decent enterprise, 
the number of real breaches is relatively small anyway. So you want to have people that are practicing mm -hmm. all the time so that when the real thing happens, it's not, you know, oh, now what do I do? How do I investigate this? Where do I get the data for that? And, and so having practice investigating things all the time, I think, is a very valuable exercise. It, it, maybe it is, maybe it costs $1.3 million, but ultimately it's, uh, it could save you many millions of others for those handful of things that you really need to deal with in the course of the year. So now, if, if you also assume that when you have these false positives, you're making the changes to your, pro your process to decrease the number of false positives in the future, you're, you're improving your system there. Absolutely. So if you treat yeah, that as right. not just practice, but continuous improvement of your detection, mm -hmm. that has value too. I mean, if, if all you do was you know, come up against true positives all the time, and maybe you've, your, your signature won't catch this latest variation, but maybe you, through all those false positives, you say, well, I could tune this here slightly, mm -hmm. that may have more value. Yeah, I'm not, I, I use the same term, tuning. I'm not a big fan of the word tuning because, it, I mean, perhaps uh, better would be root cause analysis. That is, why did you get a false positive? Was it because the signature was bad? Was it because the threshold was bad or could be better? Or is it some other aspect? Maybe is there's something in the system that isn't quite right that's triggering alarms that you could fix the system and not have it create those alarms. So there are a lot of, I think, opportunities. And to your point, if you treat each one of those, or at least groups of them, <laughs> as opportunities for improvement. You have a better opportunity for identifying the real events. Right, right. And I, I completely understand. Finding false positives is terribly disappointing for an analyst. And it feels like- For an analyst. For an analyst. I, I have a little different perspective. Right. But it's <laughs> okay, okay. No, that's fair. No, but I, 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 I know that, John, you, we could probably both speak to this, that a lot of times we'll start running something down and find out that it's a fluke, that it's some weird traffic caused by some system that's very mm -hmm. susceptible to creating random looking or maybe very, very varied traffic. And then they say, mm -hmm. this, is, this is really interesting. And it turns out it's, it's not. And you go, dang, I just yeah. wasted an hour. But I don't really see a, a great way around that besides mm -hmm. continuous improvement of your own process, which I think this will help with. Yeah, yeah. And I don't I see it as a bad thing, because like you said, a few false positives every now and then is good, because every time you do it, and you go through the process, you're just gonna be faster and faster each next right. time. Assuming the systems you know, can get you the data you need at whatever mm -hmm. speed, you know, so that might be a limiting factor. But you know, I know when we hit false positives, maybe initially in looking at some, some kind of new uh, event or alert we get, it might take a while to kind of get the data we need, but then the next time we see it, if it's a week later, we know what to go right for, and then you get kind of practiced at that. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, learning through false positives is not a bad thing. Yeah. I, you know, I think one of the points the article was trying to make is that automation is an important part of this, continued improvement automation. That's kind of what we were talking about here. I think we're absolutely on track with that. One of the challenges that I see in automation is that as the automation gets really complex, it makes it much more difficult to determine what the right next step is. That is. I have the tendency to prefer a little bit less complex algorithm that's maybe a little bit less accurate, but is more understandable. That is, you can get a feel for, oh, if I turn this knob, it's gonna fix that, that, that problem. Whereas I've seen algorithms with so many knobs and so many, you know, it, it makes it much more difficult to, to figure out, you know, if I tune this one, well, who knows what else you cut out by turning that, you know, turning that knob. That, perhaps even the wrong direction. So I, that's one of the other fundamental balances that I think is a, is a bit of a, you know, it's a challenge in the, in the process of automation. So in any case, we'll take a little bit of a simplistic look at some of the activity we've seen on the internet over the last week or so. And John, you have the first item here. Um, zero access so is- Zero access, we haven't looked at it a long time. And um, uh, so I thought I'd get a screenshot of what it looks like, the activity that we've been seeing. And from the chart here, you can see it's definitely on a kind of declining, continuous declining trend here, which mm -hmm. is good. I haven't really, it was just one of those things that came to mind, you know, today. So I hadn't really done any more investigation into what's going on with zero access. You know, we know zero access was a big uh, click fraud activity. Mm -hmm. They also had some Bitcoin mining operations, I think, in there. 
that they were engaged in. Uh, but um, there were various takedown operations. I think one of those big dips in there was one of those takedown operations where it resurged. And I think Microsoft did one where the uh, botnet operators actually like raised a little virtual white flag saying, okay, mm -hmm. we give up. I don't know if they actually gave up right away because I think we saw a little bit more activity emerging. Yeah, there was, uh, they, there, there was some additional use, there, not additional recruiting, but additional use of the existing through the uh, the P2P network, even though the uh, sort of the basic command and control had been taken out. Right. But this trend is indicating that I would think that there's less bots involved. Mm -hmm. um, either they're gone altogether or they've moved on to ports that we don't know about, which I don't think is the case, but uh, it's definitely a downward trend here. So I guess we'll keep an eye on it. Maybe we'll do a little more study and see if we can get more information on what's been going on in that space for next week. Yeah. Definitely an encouraging sign. You know, what's what's interesting, we, we don't have the, the comparison here, but you know, we've been following the Conficker activity as well, and it has been also going down, but not like this. And that kind of surprises me. I'm not sure if it's just because the Conficker is kind of on real you know, perhaps the old XP machines to a large extent and because it's been around, you know, quite a bit longer right. farther back. And uh, you know, for those that they're, they're not getting the automatic updates, whereas uh, I think the larger user base associated with this is perhaps has the automatic updates and they've been getting cleaned out as time goes on. I, I'm speculating on this. I don't really have a, a stronger explanation for it. So. Right, right. All right, next item here is uh, scan sources and probes on port 32764 TCP. This is exactly what we covered last week here. Um, it, this is associated with uh, some backdoors on several router brands, associated with Cisco, Linksys, Netgear, Diamond. Uh, I understand at least in some circumstances there are some patches around this. Uh, at least in one circumstance, the patch wasn't really a patch. It would kind of hid the, the back door a little bit more. But uh, you can go ahead and take a look at the URL that's listed there the, to um, Synactive. Uh, and take a look at the um, the presentation because it does provide a little additional insight. And there's a a, a pointer to uh, GitHub, and this is actually from last year where uh, it described a lot of the details, of specific models that exhibited this, and a number of models that don't exhibit the problem. But in any case, the uh, sources here are coming from a variety of consumer source addresses. That is indicating that it is actually home devices, home routers that are uh, that are basically infected and, and participating in the scanning activity. And the, uh, the date that I'm pointing out here, by the way, uh, April 18th, 2014, uh, we're looking at a year of activity here. April 18th is the date of this, uh, this particular presentation that's posted online. So it gives a little bit of a window, perhaps some of this activity further back was actually associated with research, or maybe that's what prompted the research into this activity. And then there were, have been some periodic probes since then, but we're seeing clearly a resurgence act of activity. And again, the scanning activity is originating from a number of consumer addresses, indicating that it is uh, basically botnet behavior. Next item here is scan probes on port 11.2.11 TCP. Uh, this is associated with uh, basically a memory caching service that uh, is generally used associated with uh, web caching. The uh, sources here are from all from a single, a common US-based uh, provider. Uh, basically, I think a, I'm, I'm going to loosely use the term cloud service provider. It's really sort of an ISP. But in any case, there is some recent uh, vulnerability notices associated with this particular application. In particular, uh, CVE 2000, actually this dates back a little bit, it says 2011-4971. I think there was actually some recent update associated with this, but it originally was published on uh, December 12, 2014. This is a case where it allows remote attackers to cause a denial of service attack, which is a little bit, uh, you know, it's, it's not a remote code execution, so I'm not really sure what would be motivating a lot of probing activity around this. Again, I'm a little bit sort of speculating about the sort of the cause and effect here. In any case, we saw activity that's kind of been uh, spiky, periodic, daily uh, type activity starting around the middle of November. And then uh, it's continuing on, has gotten a little bit denser in the last uh, couple few weeks here. So that activity, to a large extent, attributed to a, a single provider, a number of addresses in that provider performing that activity. So there's a chance it's uh, uh, you know basically a researcher uh, investigating the presence of this uh, this port activity, but uh, nevertheless that port really shouldn't be exposed to the internet. So if you're using uh, 
I guess my recommendation is to basically scan all the ports of any services you have, uh, servers that you have exposed to the internet, make sure that you're not exposing services that don't really need to be there. Next item here is bytes on source port, 1900 UDP. This is a simple service discovery protocol, and it's one of the well-known ports associated with uh, basically the uh, distributed reflection denial of service attacks. What I'm showing here is actually the last 200 days or so of activity, where this activity really kind of started around July 26, 2014, and we've seen a sort of, not a steady, but we've certainly seen an upward trend in terms of using this port for denial of service attack activity. And so what I thought I would do, since we're looking at one of the ports here that's commonly used for these reflection attacks, uh, to basically look at a composite of uh, the ports that are used commonly in uh, these reflection type of attacks. Not necessarily, these aren't necessarily the only ports that would be used. The ports we're showing here are basically port zero. Port zero is associated with packet fragmentation for the most part, so it's not really a port in itself. It's really associated with contributions from uh, a lot of these other uh, ports that are used. Uh, port 1900, port 123, that's uh, network time protocol. Port 53, that's uh, DNS, and there is some legitimate DNS traffic out there. Port 161 UDP, that's uh, simple network management protocol. And then port 19 UDP, that's uh, character generator or charging. Basically what we can see are some clear sort of evolutional phases in this activity. And we're looking back at the last 30 months, about two and a half years, similar to what we were looking at with the zero day activity just recently. Zero access. Uh, excuse yeah. me, yes, zero access, zero day being a different thing. So uh, this dates back to about June 2012. The first port that we saw here was basically was DNS. So we saw, and you can see, you know, this might have been sort of the what you'd expect from DNS activity way back then. There was actually a little bit of reflection attack activity going on at the time. As time went on, around May 2013 or so, we started to see character generator pop into the scene, and that's been increasingly used. And then uh, you also see a sort of a what I would call a relatively significant increase in the fragmentation uh, of uh, packets in that case, because uh, character generator is able to generate basically multiple packets of, uh, yeah, a of lot response of, activity. A lot of junk it spits out. There's a lot of right. fragmentation we pick up with character generator. Absolutely. Yeah. Later in 2013, uh, and then into 2004, the beginning of 2014, that was when the Monlist command was mm -hmm. discovered Ends associated with a network time protocol that created a significant amount of amplification. And as you can see, that really spiked up through the roof for a period of time. And then work was done to try to patch down or, or put protective uh, measures into place so that the Monlist command could be used as a part of the amplification activity. That did put a little bit of a damper on use of a network time protocol, but it certainly is still continuing up to this day and sometimes uh, significant spikes. The most significant spikes are, tend to be still associated with network time protocol. And then it was right around in August 2014, as we were just looking at a little bit earlier, where the uh, simple, uh, excuse me, port 1900 simple service discovery protocol uh, started contributing to this. And we're seeing some uh, more significant contributions here with that dark green activity. And more generally, just looking at, you know, over the last two and a half years, as we progress forward, a continuing increase in trends in terms of the number of attacks that are taking place and the size of attacks that are taking place. And you know, just as a reference point, I think at every, any point in time, you could probably see on the order of, I'm going to guess, you know, somewhere between a dozen and 20 different denial of service attacks that are going on at any, any given time that I would describe as significant enough to, uh, you know, basically kind of put a blip on the radar. And uh, also of uh, significance here is there's no break. It's not as if, you know, there's an attack occasionally. Occasionally you hear about them in the press, uh, but the, uh, the fact is attacks are going on all the time to a variety of different targets. And uh, if you'd seen, I guess we had debated whether we were going to talk about the Lizard Squad stressor. Uh, there were a lot of addresses, I think uh, 3,900 addresses that they identified as being targets in those attacks. Uh, these are not associated with those attacks, but uh, it's very indicative of the same type of, um, you know, sort of the the target profile. So uh, I'm sure there are plenty of articles out there on that topic, and perhaps we can talk about that a little bit more next week. Uh, but certainly uh, very similar types of behavior. Uh, next item here, scan probes on port uh, 7001 TCP. 
and uh, help me out, Matt. <laughs> it's related to uh, cache managers for okay. Oracle WebLogic. Okay, so uh, you, we were talking about the Oracle patches earlier, and uh, there's a possibility that this is related. And we have a little bit of additional evidence to kind of support that. We're looking at 90 days of activity, and there's been some very regular scanning activity on this port. And it's all, almost, not all, not all of it, but a good portion of it attributable to the same source. It's a specific source uh, coming from China, and it's also probing pretty consistently on uh, port 110, port 1433, port 1521, 1521 being Oracle database, port 1723, 3328, uh, 3306 and 8081. So these are really basically email, database interfaces, and uh, proxies, and actually a point-to-point -point tunneling protocol as well. That's uh, the 1723. So, in any case, looking for a variety of things, uh, possibly you know accesses a system for uh, a variety of purposes here. Looking at the top 10 most probed ports, no real surprises here. Not There haven't been really any significant changes from the last week. Um, port 53 UEP has uh, kind of popped up on the list, moved up a little bit, but that's not unusual to uh, see scanning activity uh, looking for, uh, oftentimes looking for open DNS resolvers. At the top of the list, port 135 TCP followed by 9064, 9064 being basically a proxy application, followed by port 23 and port 22 TCP. Those are uh, command line access uh, Telnet and uh, SSH respectively, followed by 1900 UDP, we've already talked about that one, 8080 TCP, proxy access, 445 TCP, we talked a little bit earlier about the conficker, and then followed by 33D9 TCP, that's remote desktop protocol, and then finally uh, 1433, which is uh, Microsoft SQL database. Looking at the uh, most sources, top 10 with the most sources doing the probing, uh, port 23 way up at the top of the list here. Uh, I did take a look at how that's trending. It actually is slightly down from uh, when we had talked last week, but uh, still way up. In the, and this is basically scanning for uh, vulnerable devices, Internet of Thing devices, uh, if you will, home routers and uh, security surveillance, camera DVRs and such. And then followed by port 445 TCP, 27015 UDP, basically a, a P2P application, and then followed by 6881 UDP. And we also have 6881 TCP on the list here. Those are both associated with BitTorrent. We're going to take a little bit closer look at that in a moment. We have 1900 UDP, which we already talked about, and then uh, just a, a few different uh, ICMP ports. ICMP uh, echo request happens to be on the list here, which is um, you know, oftentimes used to uh, probe to identify hosts and perhaps do probing for other things as well. So taking a closer look at port 6881 UDP, uh, we're looking at the last 90 days, and there is, again, this is generally associated with BitTorrent. It could be some other application that has some uh, similar characteristics. But in any case, we have seen a significant increase in that activity over the last 90 days, really kind of starting, well, we had a little bit of a bump starting up around mid-November and then uh, a big bigger kicker up around Thanksgiving. So I'm thinking this is perhaps associated with some sort of a new game. First inclined to think that it's, uh, it's innocuous, not really a security issue. The participants here are a variety of consumer participants, but uh, it does need a little more investigation. There's a possibility that this is related to maybe a command and control associated with the Internet of Things, but uh, I think that's perhaps stretching it. That would be, uh, I would put that in the category of conspiracy theories. So that's our show for today. I'd like to thank you for joining us. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at threattrack at list.att.com. Uh, you can find ThreatTrack on the at t Tech channel. It's att.com slash ThreatTrack. Uh, and it's also available on YouTube and iTunes. And you can follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at ATT Security. I'd like to thank you, Matt. Thank you, John. Uh, good show today. I'm Brian Rexrode, and uh, we'll be back next week with a new episode. And until then, keep your network safe. <laughs>